Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have an awful lot of news to get through in today's video. I want to start things out, though, with AMD, specifically really big news for AMD's HEDT platform, also known, of course, as Threadripper as three new SKUs have been spotted, and these are going to be apparently known as the Threadripper Pro series. This originated on Chip Hell, however, subsequently the thread was actually hidden, but not before HXL on Twitter managed to grab copies of the images. However, subsequently there have been a couple of updates, one from videocards.com and the second from Rogame. We'll start with Rogame first. He found an engineering sample which actually dated back to December of 2019. He said that specification-wise it looks really close, to the 3990X, but the OPN is different. And, well, this appears to collaborate what we're seeing with the Chip Health Forums. Basically, this is going to be absolutely... I can't use any word other than just bonkers, crazy, absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's essentially epic, but designed around the HEDT platform for your home and is going to feature eight memory channels, which is double what the consumer-grade Threadripper pro uh, processors can support, which is only four, and up to two terabytes of capacity for memory, which is up from a, quite frankly, paltry 256 gigabytes. Now, I know that 256 gigs is probably more than most of you have in your systems, and I don't mean it to sound like it's a, an insignificant number. However... If you're dealing with massive data sets, 256 gigs is not actually that big. Um, it can get eaten up really fast, which is one reason that some folks will still go Intel on HEDT, despite the fact that technically uh, their processors themselves are slower, but with the memory configuration of Threadripper, uh, it can lead to some workloads being basically hampered. So this series of processors, according to videocards.com, is allegedly going to see some type of announcement or launch the 14th of this month, which is, well, about a week from now. And what's super duper interesting about this is it actually confirms a series of rumours and information that came up last year. If you've been a longer term viewer, you'll know that I extensively covered three platforms, one was WRX40, which turned out to be the second generation ROM processors. And then we also had TRX40, which turned out to be Fred Ripper 3000. And then we had uh, TRX80. But there was very little that was learned about TRX80, so we thought it potentially was dead. But one of my sources, uh, as I reported back then consistently was informing me that no, it really was a thing, and that we would have a 8-channel uh, Threadripper processor. And this was something I confirmed again early this year. I believe it's like January or February, something like that, that I put out a video. I'll try to remember to screenshot it in, the, uh, in this video, if that makes any sense. Either way, this particular platform will be extremely interesting, I suspect, for people who absolutely need that amount of data capacity. It's certainly not something that I myself would benefit with my workloads, but if you are like a data scientist or you want to do some other things like a lot of virtualization, this could be a phenomenal processor. There are still a lot of questions, though, what separates it from Epic? Perhaps something to do with the I.O., perhaps as well clock frequencies as well, and I will just echo what I said a few moments ago. This is absolutely crazy. This is certainly not going to be a cheap processor by any stretch of the imagination, but it is going to be a pretty damn amazing one. Allegedly, there are going to be three SKUs, which of course mirrors what we are seeing with the non-pro lineup, and we can assume there will be a similar core configuration. So, for example, 64 cores, 32 cores, and so on. And honestly, I will be very interested to see what the comparisons are for workload to workload 
from, let's say, 64 core 4 channel versus the Pro 8 channel. And we are now going to mosey again to the land of NVIDIA, where Ampere is galloping around in its fields. Well, maybe not quite galloping, but allegedly we have some further clarifications on the specifications of the RTX 30 series, and furthermore, we also learned that some of the SKUs have been taped out. Let's start things out with the specs. I'm not going to read out all of these because, quite frankly, I will be here until next Christmas, but all of this is thanks to Kopity 7 Kimmy, and he's basically done a summary of what he's previously put in uh, put up, excuse me, plus furthermore, he's put to the TDP of the uh, GPUs as well. I also find the TDP figures here very interesting, with only 30 watts separating the 3090 versus the 3080. And you can see, once again, 4,352 versus 5,248. I presume that the 3080 will have higher clock frequencies, but what seems to really separate them is the amount of RAM. We don't have 11 gigabytes with any of these SKUs. Instead, it's 24 for the 3090, and, well, the 3080 has 10. I suppose you could technically say that NVIDIA have increased the amount of RAM for the 80 SKU. After all, previously, the 2080 um, only had 8 gigabytes, and the same with the 1080. So it does also make you wonder what the hell, because there's quite a large jump between the 3080 and the 3090. So will we see a 3080 Ti? Recently we did see, of course, that leak from Asus that allegedly was a 3080 Ti, and I honestly think that there's a good probability there will be, because the cost of the, that RAM... Um, whether we'll see it at launch or not, who the hell knows. But uh, skipping forward to the next piece of uh, NVIDIA news, and that comes to Cat Corgi, and this is the size of the die, which for the highest end SKU, uh, which once again is the 3090, it is allegedly 627 mm squared, which is quite frankly, well, big. Finally, on the subject of uh, Ampere, I also state that Kopity 7 Kimi believes that both GA106 and GA107 have taped out. As a quick reminder, Kopity 7 Kimi in particular has proven trustworthy in the past, but isn't to say, of course, that their information is going to continue to be accurate, but this is probably a good sign that, uh, well, it's happening. Um, I don't think it's going to be too long before we start seeing actual real leaked benchmarks for Ampere. And hopefully with the second generation of RDNA, because frankly, I am super excited. And finally, console-related stuff. There's a couple of very interesting stories floating around. The first of which is from website Video Game Chronicles. And this is a report that Microsoft are telling games developers that if they wish to provide a next-gen upgrade to a game. So, just for the sake of argument, you purchase a title uh, for the Xbox One. You can't then be sold DLC slash an upgrade for that title for the Xbox Series X. So, whether this is new features for the game or whether that's just better graphics like textures or what have you, this cannot be done. Furthermore, this is not... A contingent on whether they participate in the smart delivery program. Now, that doesn't mean that all upgrades can be exactly um, free. So, what you could do as a publisher is choose to have like a cross gen bundle, which is, it seems like how uh, 2K Games is circumventing this with like NBA 2K21. Um, but obviously, Microsoft really want to provide the publisher's options, yes, on how to purchase games, especially for the first couple of years that the console's out, and then obviously you've got that cross-generation. But Microsoft, too, want to encourage you to obviously uh, buy their console. And I would also say buy their console over what Sony are offering. And obviously there have been quite a few rumours concerning what uh, is happening with CD Projekt Red with Microsoft, 
we know, for example, that uh, Microsoft have already debuted it, of course, at, the, at their own conference, and they also are going to be offering, uh, yes, smart delivery with Cyberpunk, as well as other games as well, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, but Microsoft are also allegedly going to be implementing Cyberpunk with Game Pass as well. I think this is really great news, to be honest, uh, as end users. I really hope that this goes through. Um, I must admit that remasters can be cool. I think some remasters are okay. For example, The Last of Us 1 remaster on the PS4 I thought was pretty good. Um, as obviously you've got a much higher frame rate, it fixed some issues and so on and so on. But I think, quite frankly, there are quite a few games which really and truly they don't deserve the extra cash for the um, for the upgrade, so to speak. So I'm going to be very interested to see how this works when it's formally announced. It's still kind of wishy-washy at the moment, and obviously uh, publishers pressuring Microsoft may have them change things slightly, but I would be very curious to see how this comes into a real product, or at the very least, a real deal. And then the final piece of news for today, let's talk about a mid-generation refresh. And this is according to a former Xbox executive, Albert Pinello, who was discussing this on the Reset Era forums. As you are likely aware, the PS4 uh, and Xbox One both received a mid-generation refresh, and this is for numerous reasons, not least of which is the uh, slow but uh, steady adoption of 4K screens. And honestly, over the past couple of years, it's really sped up with 4K displays not being that much different in price than 1080p. And even larger 4K screens, like just for example 65 inches, have come down hugely in price. You no longer have to sell the organs of everyone in your family to afford one. They are actually pretty damn affordable now, and you can even get pretty damn impressive HDR models. I think one of the things that we will start to see, of course, on uh, start coming down in price as well as become more consistent is uh, displays with higher refresh rates, but that is in the future. Anyway, what about the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5? Will we see a PS5 Pro and will we see an Xbox Series X? Um, X? I know. God knows what Microsoft would call it. And according to Albert Pinello, he does not think this is the case. He thinks it's unnecessary, with 4K mainstream becoming the resolution for PC and TVs, the base consoles were designed around driving 1080p, or less output. This, of course, by the way, was back in the day. When you have a set that requires four times the performance just to drive 4K pixels, you end up eating all of that performance up just to drive the resolution, I think it's unlikely that we'll see 8K TVs go mainstream the same way we saw 4K go mainstream. I think we're more likely to see improvements in nits to drive better HDR, or better frame rates to support greater than 60 FPS on TVs. CPU and GPUs in the next gen should easily support higher frame rates and wider colours. And he also adds in a second post that... Creating a machine that's got, let's say, 20 or 24 T-flops just may not be affordable in a console form factor, even in, let's say, three-ish years. He says, and I quote, I don't see a 24 T-flop machines being affordable in a console form factor in three years. There's no change from 7 to 5 or 3 NM. It's going to be cost prohibitive. And just mathematically, unless you hit 3 NM, you're only going to see, let's say, 30% reduction in size, but you're doubling the T-flops so the chip has to grow. Additionally, you can't just double the GPU without growing CPU and memory, or you run into other bottlenecks, which further adds to the cost. There may be other silicon advancements I'm not privy to, but it's pretty widely known that this is a real challenge right now. So if you're looking through today's lens, I think it's unlikely that you'll see a mid-generation console uh, refresh this cycle. And honestly, I kind of agree with him to, a, to an extent. I'm very certain that Sony and Microsoft are doing um, their own research, let's say, on this topic. I'm sure that they are figuring this out. The fact of the matter is it also really depends on a lot of stuff in the world right now. Um, who the hell knows with the current global climate, obviously with 
you know, the ramifications of a certain, uh, <coughs> um, that's been floating around, you know, the, the illness that I can't mention on YouTube. Well, that's obviously had a massive uh, economic impact. And, uh, honestly, this has not been the best year for console manufacturers to release their systems. But perhaps in a couple of years' time, things will change. And as for T-Flops, well, I suppose it really depends heavily on what they do for the systems. I mean, if you have a 12 T-Flop system, but then, let's say, um, uh, AMD with RDNA 4, or who knows, it's probably like going to be more like RDNA 5, assuming they still are on RDNA. We know RDNA 3 is uh, currently quite far along in development, and I believe they've already started uh, designing RDNA 4. So there's a pretty good chance that Microsoft and Sony have a good insight to uh, what AMD are doing. And they probably are doing some testing. In my opinion, I don't think that they're going to want to provide extra grunt to actually run um, games necessarily at higher resolutions. But will they instead go for higher frame rates? I think one possibility, if pro consoles do launch, and I will actually be doing a, a more extensive video on this in the future, but I think one possibility of pro consoles would be that they even further improve things like DLSS, or shall I say AI upsampling, I'm using the NVIDIA technology name there, and also potentially push higher frame rates in games. That would definitely be one way to go. But Albert is definitely right. Just going brute force on this is not necessarily going to be the way that uh, uh, to fix the problem. Um, and you can see the cooling solutions in the next gen systems is not it's not subtle, you know. I mean, compare the cooling solution to on, on a PS2 versus what we're seeing with the next gen Xbox or the next gen PlayStation, and there's obviously a massive difference there. And just constantly die shrinking things is not really the way to go um, in terms of the own well it's not the only way to go I think that there will definitely be some uh, architecture efficiencies that they can implement who knows what those are um, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what actually comes out of the next couple of years but I think that's a good place to call this for now because honestly I'd really like to investigate the possibility of uh, pro consoles for lack of a better term, in the not-too-distant future. I'm actually working on a script and doing some research. So I'll be uh, I'll be very interested to see what both Sony and Microsoft do end up doing. I think we can obviously expect some type of a refresh of the consoles, like, you know, like a slimline variant of them. I think that's definitely a good possibility as uh, we move to, like, a 5NM or whatever node. But uh, I really want to discuss a lot more on the on the potential for a um, for a pro console, and it's also a bigger question as well because it brings other questions up, like what happens uh, to the console life cycle if they didn't release a pro system a mid generation refresh. How long would the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation Five be current? Would be would we be looking at let's say a four or five year thing and then they would be replaced with new hardware or would it become more cloud based then? Yeah. Anyway, with all of that said, thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves and bye for now.